Hey guys. So, just a second. All right. So this is called um, push the hassle from production to developers easily. So. <laughs> so, what is what is this all about? Uh, it's about me, obviously. So, um, that's sorry. Um, so I started with uh, Commodore eight bit hardware. So that was way before all that Dell Optiplex high end hardware stuff, um, which is outside. By the way, if you saw it, <laughs> going over here. Um, so I was tinkering with null modem connections for being able to play Doom and Warcraft. I uh, did the same for IPX, SBX, but just for gaming. Um, I was working as a, as a developer at, my, at the start of my career, mainly in very small projects, which means I did have to run the stuff that I built on my own. So they did not call it DevOps back then, but it, I did dev, I did ops, so I think that was, that's just it. Now I'm at Dynatrace at the Innovation Lab, so I'm doing research. My main resp responsibilities are Microsoft technologies, uh, software architecture, and all that kind of stuff. You can find me on Twitter, uh, Martin Goodwell. Um, what connects me to DevOps is I'm passionate about live technology and the people behind both of them, so I've been... Um, part of many, many great projects with many great people, and the things I remember most are the people, not the technology. So I hardly remember whether that was Google Web Toolkit or whether that was Spring or whatever, but I remember all the people. So machines won't miss you when you're gone. This is something I think uh, we, should, we should keep in mind. So um, we will start with some rules. We will do some warm up. So as we've learned just a couple of minutes ago, not all of you are there already. Um, then I will talk about monitoring, logging, call tracing, databases, um, and finally, there's commercial offers in that space as well. I will just really briefly touch what's the difference between the commercial offerings and the open source stuff. There is a little bit of a difference, by the way. So uh, if, you, if you have questions, please feel free to ask anytime. We can make this as interactive as or as non-interactive as you want. but. Keep in mind the, the open space discussions in the afternoon, so maybe if you feel that your question might be something worth discussing, just bring it on in, in the afternoon. Uh, or of course, you can track me down anytime around here you see me. So still, still wearing the same shirt as yesterday, but it's another instance, it's not the same. So, all right. Warm up, so how many of you, <coughs> sorry, how many of you are actually in Dev. Okay, then how many in ops? That's really the majority. So <laughs> usually it's really hard to tackle down operations guys at such conferences between uh, because it's usually all about the developers. Any executives or um, not technical people? All right. All right. <laughs> Then, uh, to your technology stack, who of you is doing Node? <laughs> who is proud of it? <laughs> right. um, go uh, Java, .NET. OK, so lots of hands not up. So I guess the rest of you is operations, right? Uh, Python, PHP, right. Anyone? Assembler? <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> last thing for warm up. Uh, who of you does monitoring already? That's good. Who does logging? All right. <laughs> Call tracing. Not so much. Uh, who of you knows what APM is or who does APM, application performance monitoring or management? All right. Just about a little bit more than. And call tracing. So um, the first thing is the ops dilemma, what I call the ops dilemma. So between dev and ops, there is a difference, apparently. Developers deal with single transactions, whereas opera operators do have with hundreds of thousands of transactions in case of a problem in production. 
Um, developers can deal with specific problems. When an operator has a problem in production, he has usually, at the beginning, no idea what the, what the cause is. Developers do not have to deal with real user impact, because if they did, they would be reacting to bug reports much faster. Uh, developers can concentrate on single components instead of lots of moving parts. Um, their deadlines refer to sprints, which are usually weeks or maybe even longer. Uh, operators, operators have to face SLAs, so a much, much shorter, shorter time frame. So this, this leads to some kind of... Um, so it should really be not a one-way. This is what the title is about. It should be a circle. So, you know, from dev into to up, so from pre-production into production, and then a feedback loop back from production into, into development. And so for the second part of that feedback loop, the operator needs to find out which ones of those hundreds and thousands of transactions are actually relevant for the developer then he usually has, as I said before, no idea what the cause is. So he has to find, he has to isolate that big pile of mud into a specific problem a developer can deal with, and all that kind of stuff. So everything that is neatly automated from developers to operators <clears throat> um, is not so much automated back into development. So <clears throat> DevOps deals with automation, right? So we have continuous integration, deployment, delivery pipelines. We can trigger unit tests for fast feedback when, when de developers check in code. We have build servers, we have repositories keeping track of every single version that we ever built. We have automatic deployment, so on a single mouse click you have your stuff in production. Uh, this all helps developers getting stuff into production really easy, but at least as far as I'm concerned, it does nothing for the opposite direction. So DevOps is about <coughs> sorry. DevOps is about collaboration, right? Collaboration requires documentation. Uh, and automation is implicit documentation. Anyone who can read a Maven XML file, who can read a chef recipe or whatever, is automatically able to read the documentation, which does not have to be kept up to date in parallel. But there is no automation for supporting ops with, with troubleshooting. So what can we do, or what do we do today already for, for making it easier for operations to, to solve that problems? So for one, there is monitoring. We have Nagios, for example, which is pretty easy to set up for one host. It's not so easy anymore if you've got 100 hosts. It gives you all the basic metrics. You have CPU usage, memory, all the kind of stuff. Um, that might have been uh, OK a couple of years ago when you still had one server for one application. So you had your database server, you had your file server, you had your application servers. But today we have maybe lots of um, things running on a single host. Um, so you do not have insight into the details. You do not have insight into applications, performance, and problems. So if you want to do it in your code, in your application, you could start with something like this. So this is Java code. I think everyone should be able to get it. Um, no offense. Um, you can do it as simply as uh, writing um, just timestamps in your in your log files. So here, for example, start milliseconds, duration milliseconds. You know, log the duration. That puts it in your in your log file. Uh, I will come to that in a second. Log files are not the best place to do this. So you can use something like StatsD. Who of you guys knows StatsD or is using StatsD? All right, most of you. So StatsD basically allows you to. Um, so for those of you who do not know StatsD, you have your application, you have uh, client libraries, StatsD client libraries in your applications, you have on the local host a StatsD daemon running who receives UDP packages. So in your code, you do something like increase counter or whatever. StatsD daemon is, is getting that request and forwards it to a monitoring backend. So 
this is really independent from the technology you, you use that D is available for all languages, more or less. So this is already a pretty good way to, to deal with, with that uh, monitoring problem. But there are downsides. So for example, you pollute your business logic, your, your application code with monitoring code. So this is this, this, the cross-cutting constant problem we, we face all the time. It's more or less the same about logging. You can do it with AOP, for example, as oriented programming, but that really requires advanced skills because you can mess up your application really, really easy with uh, when you do AOP the wrong way. Um, and if you're not using something like StatsD, for example, you have your metrics all around the place. It's just like with log files. You have so many different log files, you have to collect them on your own and, and stuff like that. So we had a good, um, a good open space yesterday about, about logging. So this approach is good for, for single component insight. Into your single component, you can see what's happening there. But what about calls to third parties? What about microservices? So distributed uh, transactions, for example. What about calls to databases? You cannot write a stored procedure that measures your execution times, I think. So, yeah. Logging. Uh, another very, so most of you do it. Um, one th problem with logging is probably the same with monitoring. So you log your service A, you log your service B, you log your service C. If you have a problem somewhere in that transaction, um, you really have a hard time figuring out which request in which component was connected to which other request and which other component. So the one thing you should do is you should introduce correlation IDs, for example. So the first, the first service that receives the call, usually you will have something like an API gateway or whatever, introduces the correlation ID, puts it into the request header, and from there on it's forwarded across all your, all your requests. And then a log statement, you write any, any metrics you collect you can correlate them to this correlation ID, which makes it really easy for tools like the Elk stack, for example, to um, find log lines of one single transaction. So this is, this is really, really an easy, uh, important. So what have we learned from, from logging? So you should really use a logging server, for example, the Elk stack. Uh, and then you should really directly log as JSON. So it makes it so much easier for Elasticsearch to filter your, your log lines uh, if it is JSON objects. Um, if you cannot log as JSON, you should at least store it as JSON. So if you have your legacy applications that write the log lines as they always did, you have Elk Stack gives you the possibility to, to filter, to mutate the log lines. So you ha can have an incoming string, you can match the pattern and transform, transform it to some, some JSON object and store that JSON object. So logging is really great for, for troubleshooting, but logging, using logging for monitoring is really, really expensive because you have so much data that is not at all about metrics. So you, you have probably more than 90, when, it, when you want to use logging for monitoring, you probably have 90% of the data there, which is just noise. So for me, logging uh, is really important for a specific time frame where you identified a problem. So if your metrics told you that you have a problem, then you should go look into your log files at this specific time frame and see what the log file shows you. Um, as I said before, we had that really great open space uh, in the afternoon yesterday. Um, one question was, what's the best logging framework? So as far as Java was concerned, uh, I can only recommend Logback and SLF4J. So SLF4J, the simple logging facade for Java. It gives you the ability to change underlying logging implement implementations really easy. And then Logback, as far as I'm concerned, is the best uh, logging framework for Java so far because it gives you that asynchronous monitoring possibilities. So you can really hammer out log lines all the time and there is a, a dedicated logging thread so you're not blocking your application 
and stuff. You can you can configure your log back to to write to local log files. You can send your log files to Logstash. You can even hook it up to a a syslog client. So that's really um, the most flexible solution I've come across. Call tracing. So um, Google published. Uh, a paper called the Google Tapper paper in 2010. So it's a dinosaur already. It's six years old. And there are some solutions that build on top of that Google Tapper paper. So one is, for example, open tracing. Another one is Sipkin, which uh, has been initiated by Twitter. So I'm just uh, showing you the links here. So you can, you can, you can look it up on your own later on. The architecture is more or less um, comparable to, to what we had with, with StatsD before, for example. So you have your instrumented client. Uh, for Sipkin, for example, you do it with, with annotations. So you annotate your, your methods. Is anyone using Sipkin here, by the way? Great. So you should <laughs> catch that guy and ask him about it. Um, and you Annotations report report uh, that stuff to to the Sipkin backend more or less, which then writes it into a database. Sipkin is a little bit more than just that, so it also provides some some user interface. For example, this is a a code sample. Just I really just took this from from the GitHub page, so you you will be easy to find it. Um, this is what a, a Sipkin UI looks like, for example. So here you have the, the original request in the first line. Then it does another service call, and you see where it started on the right-hand side, where it stopped. So first call, second call, third call, and then you have some cascaded method calls. So this way you can, you can analyze your, your call traces, so you can identify bottlenecks. Really easy, which is important if you want to know why this call, why, why did it take one second for this call to start? So you can see maybe there is another one blocking it before. Then if you just Google for microservice visualization, call tracing, whatever, you find lots of stuff. So I just collected a, a number of uh, a number of links on, on GitHub or on Google in general. So this is, for example, the Ordina JWorks microservices dashboard. So if you're using Spring, for example, you can build visualization like this in a quite easy way. So you're also using this? <laughs> ah, you did it. <laughs> Great. OK, so. <laughs> No, nothing, nothing more to add. Another one for Spring Cloud Sleuth. I think, I hope I, I, I um, pronounced that correctly. This also gives you that transaction view. So you have subsequent calls, you have split calls, stuff like that. But that Spring, for example, all, all quite Java heavy. This is for Node.js, for example, for the one or two guys of you here admitting doing it. So what I just wanted to show you. Um, I think there is no hidden gems out there. So you just Google for call tracing, your technology, and you will find so much stuff. So that GitHub thing is really great because they're offering all that stuff for free. So you can just jump in and do it. One thing we have been missing so far was databases. So what can we do for databases? And this is some kind of, this is a bit hard. So of course, there are for every database, there are specific monitoring tools, but from an application's perspective, what can you do? Um, two things I've worked with was, for one, I use dbmaintain for database automation. So dbmaintain, do you guys know dbmaintain? Anyone here? Okay, so dbmaintain keeps a table in your database where it keeps track of your database deployments. So you do not change the database directly but you check in your SQL statements, your DDL statements. So um, you can, and then you can even include it in your, your Maven builds, for example. So you can trigger a Maven release build and it updates your database or it, it creates your database uh, in case it's the initial commit, yeah? Comparable to Flyway or Liquid? Yeah, I think so, okay. yeah. Um, so database automation is something you should definitely do. Besides 
um, allowing you to do your database updates automatically. It, it logs the process, the progress, so you can see what you did. It also allows you to roll back database updates just in case um, that's doable from a, from a data perspective. And the other one I've worked with was log for JDBC. So this is a logging framework which implements the SLF for JFacade. So you can use log for JDBC as your JDBC driver, which then wraps your real JDBC driver. And you can write log statements about database performance. So any database statement that's executed by log for JDBC will write a log line with the metrics you want to have. So this allows you to, to get insights into, uh, into your, your database performance metrics uh, very good. But it's just usable for pre-production, so we, we, we used it in production. We set it to mute so that it just forwards every request directly to the real JDBC driver, but um, CPU usage was very, very high. So just use it for pre-production. DB maintain is stable, though. All right, so about five minutes left. Um, the commercial neighborhood. So I've showed you a couple of open source tools now. There's also commercial tools out there. And just really quick, I want to show you what's the difference between a commercial offering and the open source stuff, which is also really great. So the usual suspects here, Dynatrace, New Relic, App Dynamics, CoScale, thanks guys for, uh, for being a sponsor here at this great event. Um, so I can only show you real quick screenshots of our tool because I do not know the other tools, to be honest. So I did not do any, any, any spying on the other tools. Um, so commercial tools give you the possibility to not just with work with one technology, but they usually cover a broad range of technologies, java.net, node, whatever, it's all in there. Then they offer, for example, um, ready-to-run dashboards. So you, you do not need to configure your dashboards for days or for weeks to build and build out all that kind of stuff. They usually provide pretty much out of the box. So it's really about zero conf, not so much tinkering with it. So it, I think it, it, it caters the operator's perspective much more because getting a monitoring tool configured right is pretty much almost a developer's effort, I think. <laughs> Um, you have method level insight for, 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 for code and for databases. So uh, you, you can go to the point real quick. So you, you can see uh, your database statements, um, how they perform and all that kind of things. Host monitoring. So you do not need to have one thing for host, one thing for application, another thing for, for, for databases. You have it all in one place. So all those solutions, as far as I know, do this pretty well. Um, call tracing. So as you can see here, a Tomcat uh, as an entry point, go into some native process, some unmonitored thing, two Tomcats, MongoDB, another Tomcat. So that's really a bad screenshot. Um, because I should have used one with, you know, Nginx and all that kind of stuff. But I think you get the, the, you get the idea. Log analytics, another tool. So usually there's lots of stuff like, like Sumo Logic and all that um, products out there. But it's, again, another tool. So you really need to get your crew up to, up to speed with, with all kinds of different tools, um, which you might be able to cover with, with a single one as well. Full Docker Insight. We talked about Docker briefly yesterday. Docker is a really challenge. It's really a challenge for, for operators because usually a Docker container gives you that power to isolate your stuff, right? For monitoring, you do not want to isolate it because you need to get inside for monitoring it. So commercial tools usually give you the option of automatically monitoring the stuff inside Docker, plus providing insights for the container metrics as such. Dedicated support for most important technologies. So as far as we are concerned, we, we show you AWS metrics, Azure metrics, VMware metrics, all that, all that, that stuff. We do automated baselining, automatic root cause analysis, which is really closing that feed gap, uh, feedback loop. Uh, we are also supporting PagerDuty, so <laughs> 
just um, so you know. Um, so really, tr commercial offerings really try to automate many things that you have to deal with yourself in open source tools. So one open source tool I did not mention, I forgot about it, I just, it just came to my mind previous, uh, just right before starting, is Prometheus. Prometheus is uh, very, is also covering a broad range of, of stuff, but setting it up is a very, very tedious manual effort. So as far as, so from my perspective, the, the commercial tools really try to be the virtual war room. So, you know, the tools that try to bring people to one table to, to shorten those communication paths and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's it so far from my side. Um, I'd love to talk to you guys about anything when it comes to software architecture, performance optimization, team culture. So I'm always eager to, to hear stories from you. I had some nice, some nice discussions uh, in the afternoon yesterday and uh, at the open spaces. So I hope to see you around here. If any one of you is interested in getting some advice about anything, so I've been a developer and a team lead for 10 years myself. I've been dealing with microservices and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'd love to talk to you. Maybe, uh, maybe there's uh, something we can, we can learn still here. That's it so far. Thanks. So if there's any questions, go ahead. If not, looking forward to seeing you around. Questions, ideas. Who was shouting out that they wrote the tool? You can still do an Ignite on that. And you can also do an Ignite on Prometheus if you want to. That was Julian. Yeah. No questions? Great. They're not awake yet. Yeah. <laughs> um,